Good morning, brothers and sisters. And thank you, uh, Dr. Dockery, my friend and uh, colleague, brother in Christ. Uh, I've been here two and a half months. There's been something I've wanted to say, and I think, where do I say this? So this is where I'll say it. Uh, I love Trinity. I love Trinity. I, I pray daily for Trinity. And I am so encouraged. I am so thankful to God for leading you to come to be our president. To have uh, an experienced, effective, and truly godly leader. Uh, to be called to come and be a part of us is such a great encouragement for me. So uh, if I encourage you at all, it's only because I'm so encouraged that, that you said yes. But if the Lord called you, you had to say yes. <laughs> But uh, I wanted you to know that you are in my prayers every day, and I thank God for you. So, brothers and sisters, um, I, I believe that our Father loves to take the things in this world that he has made that are broken and to bring them back together. At least I'm going to say this. Uh, I, I know that God is engaged in a mission in this world take those things that have become hostile toward him and hostile toward one another and to make peace. At our church in Pasadena, in the Lake Avenue Church, we call those two ideas of taking broken things and bringing them together, of taking hostile things and making peace, we call that ministries of reconciliation. And over the last uh, two and a half months I've been, as I've been here within your community, I have begun to think that almost every ministry we do at our church somehow is connected to reconciliation. I mean, evangelism, isn't that all about calling people to be reconciled to God? Uh, discipleship ministries, isn't that about us as people still broken, walking toward Jesus and becoming conformed to the image of Christ and becoming whole again? Isn't our, our ministries to, with broken relationships, with, with marriages or with friendships or whatever they may, isn't that a ministry of reconciliation? And especially when we see the ravages of injustice and evil in the world and we step out in the name of Jesus to say that there is hope and there is a place of belonging, those are ministries of reconciliation. And, and my thought is this, um, our Father has already promised to us that when he's done with his work, all things will be reconciled to him in Christ through his blood shed on the cross. So here's the way I think about it. Uh, if that's true, and he's going to reconcile all things to himself in Christ, then if, if we as a church engage in ministries of reconciliation in the name of Christ, we should be able to know that the wind of God's spirit is going to be blowing at our back. Now, uh, God isn't done with that work yet. Anybody say Amen. <laughs> There's still a lot of brokenness uh, everywhere. And in fact, in the preaching class that I've taught here this past semester, Ray Chang, that I think came in because I told him, yeah, Ray, I'm not going to use you as an example of sin, but Ray Chang said, <laughs> when you think about that ministry uh, of reconciliation, what this is, is the ultimate extreme makeover. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Now, I'm not going to even try to attempt uh, to, to talk about how all the brokenness in our individual lives and in our church and in our neighborhoods and in the world can be brought together. You know as well as I do that I don't even have the ability to do that. But here's what I'm going to do. I, I'm a local church pastor. I want to talk to you about how we as a church have looked for biblical guidelines, simple biblical directives. It's kind of like jazz. These provide the direction, the parameters for us in which we have to engage in the variety of the ministries and brokenness that we see in our changing and differing communities. I thought maybe if I could identify what those are, they may be helpful for you personally and for the church or place where God may put you to serve. So where do we start? Number one, enter in. Uh, we think the starting point is entering into respect-filled relationships where even when there are big divisions, we're, we're going to cross over the fear barriers and enter in, respect people, and talk with people. No reconciliation without that. Number two, as we are involved in relationship, we're always going to call people to follow Jesus as Savior and Lord. And, and that really means, when, think about it, we're going to call people to have their conduct shaped and transformed by following Jesus as Lord, even as ours is being. 
I don't know if you know the implications of that, but I'll let you know before the end of the second Timothy series message. And then number three, when people actually follow Jesus as Lord, what happens is we are all separated sometimes from the support systems and the ways of life that we've been in before, and, and people are left feeling alone. We have to walk with, walk with people within a grace-filled, love-filled, hopefully justice-filled community. So there they are, enter in, call to, walk with. Now, in the first Timothy message, I, I just want to talk about the first, uh, this entering in peace, because I don't think there can be any reconciliation without first entering into a relationship. The question is, sometimes the brokenness between us and what's happening in people's lives is so great that it's difficult to know how to do that. So where do we learn? And I think that watching the life of Jesus provides a crystal clear starting point that, that I found helps me in almost every one of the issues that we are facing regarding reconciliation. Whether that is uh, immigration, issues related to same-sex attraction, uh, people leaving prisons and coming back into our communities, all of these issues, it seemed to me that this is the starting point. And I want to take you to a story that some may think is a rather unusual choice for a chapter like this, in which uh, Jesus enters in to the life of a person that most people would expect he would never enter into. It's the passage that Jeff just read for us, Mark chapter 7, verses 24 to 30. So in this text, we find a woman who would have been divided from uh, the community that Jesus had grown up in. I mean, in almost every way. So, so if there's going to be reconciliation, he's going to have to cross all sorts of boundaries in this. She's the kind of woman that most of the people that he would have lived with throughout his life would have said he should have nothing to do with her whatsoever. Those were his cultural values. And yet, as always, what Jesus does is he turns his cultural values and morals uh, upside down, and he enters in. So that's the text we're going to look at. If you have your Bibles, turn there. Let me tell you what gets us there. When you open Mark's gospel, the very first sentence in the gospel, which I see as a title to it, it, it tells us who Jesus is. So here it is, the beginning of, of the good news of the gospel. It's about Jesus. Who is Jesus? We know, number one, he is the Messiah, and two, he's the Son of God. So there we know it. And then we read through the rest of Mark's gospel, and we wonder if anybody else is going to find out who Jesus is. They seem to be so blind to him. Now, in the ch six chapters that lead up to this text, Jesus consistently does the things that only God can do. It's the way Mark tells the story. Bang, 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 bang. Uh, demons, are, are, is, are, are the evil powers greater than Jesus? No, he speaks a word and they're dispelled. Uh, natural disasters, big storms come. He speaks a word and they are stilled. Uh, he, he forgives sins. He even raises the dead. And yet in this place with all of these incredible, miraculous things coming, if you turn to Mark 7, verses 1 to 23, the only thing that the Pharisees and some of the religious leaders seem to care about is whether Jesus' disciples are washing their hands enough. Yeah. They, they think that the main thing that God cares about are these external things. Uh, they, they, they think that no person that is ever going to please God is going to be defiled. How? By touching uh, disease things demonized things, dead things, and especially damaged people, like Gentiles. So, there's the context. So you have to stand in some wonder when, for some undisclosed reason, in verse 24, Jesus launches right into Gentile territory <laughs> and enters into a relationship. Now, this story, if you were listening to uh, Jeff, has always been one that has baffled uh, Bible readers, especially the little story Jesus tells within this story and uses this notion of dogs. But for the first century reader, it would have done more than just baffled them. They would have said everything is wrong about this encounter that Jesus enters into. Well, what's wrong? Okay, let me just show you what's wrong. Uh, number one, it was the wrong place for Jesus to be. Verse 24 again. So Jesus left that place, probably talking about Capernaum in Galilee, among mostly 
Jewish people, and he went to the vicinity of Tyre, and he entered a house. Now again, remember that the religious leaders insisted that God isn't pleased when his children spend time with people like Gentiles. So why does Jesus intentionally head right into Gentile territory? I think I have a map here, if we got it to you from Pasadena, a map of where he actually, can, can you find that? Do we, do we have a map? No. Uh, sense of anticipation is growing uh, with, with this map. Do you, do you have a map back there? No map. So you have to pull out your ESV study Bible and find a map. Let me just tell you, if you look at verse 24 and at verse 31, what you have is Jesus going to Tyre, up to Sidon, all the way down to Decapolis, and then over to the Sea of Galilee. Let me just tell you this, brothers and sisters, that's mostly Gentile territory. It's over 120 miles. He would have been there for months uh, in Gentile territory, right after this matter that they shouldn't be touching these unclean kind of people. Now, this first stop in Tyre was especially shocking because the people of Tyre had become the arch enemies of the uh, Jewish people. The Tyrites had fought against the Jews in the most recent wars. Uh, the first century uh, 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 historian Josephus calls the people of Tyre notoriously Israel's bitterest enemies. And, and note this, the religious practices of the Tyrites were notoriously pagan. Uh, most of the religious leaders were praying that when Messiah came, the Tyrites would be eliminated and driven out. Uh, the Messiah would never enter into a relationship of respect uh, with a Gentile Tyrite, would he? But that's exactly what Jesus does in verse 24. And brothers and sisters, are you with me here? This is what you and I, in the name of Jesus, must learn to do. We must know that the Spirit of God dwells in us, and we must enter in to the places of brokenness in our world. Number two, not only the wrong kind of place, it was the wrong kind of person for Jesus to be speaking to. Verses 25 and 26. In case you might think that Jesus gets there to Tyre and he can hide away in a house and stay away from any Gentiles, Mark lets us know, no, that didn't happen. He gives us some detail about one of the people who came to Jesus in verses 25 and 26. Look at it. A woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. And then look at the detail that Mark gives us. The woman was a Greek or a Gentile born in Syria and Phoenicia. Now, what was wrong about this woman? Well, number one, that she was a woman. A woman, uh, I'm glad you're here. Uh, but you know, some of the rabbis taught that a leader should never have any public contact with women whatsoever. She was a woman. Not only was she a woman, she was a Gentile woman. Not only a Gentile woman, a Gentile Tyrite woman. <laughs> Not only a Gentile Tyrite woman, but a Gentile Tyrite woman whose house was demonized. See, even her own people would have been holding her at arm's length. So what should you do in this kind of a situation? In every conceivable way, she was the kind of person that a righteous person should avoid. But Jesus does not avoid her. And again, I say, nor should we. Are you marking this down? <laughs> the, this, the key to this is three. Wrong kind of place, wrong kind of person. Now, it's the wrong kind of response for Jesus to be making in verse 27. Just imagine yourself being a part of the scene if, if you'd been that woman. Other rabbis, other religious leaders among the Jewish people would certainly have said, keep, keep this woman away from me. <laughs> would, would have lashed out at her, you dog you, get out of this house now. What on earth or in heaven would ever make you think that a person like me would have any contact with a person like you? But then, as you find throughout the Gospels, Jesus is not like other religious leaders. And for those of us training to be what everybody will perceive to be religious leaders, from whom do we take our cues? Uh, other rabbis wouldn't have been in Tyre in the first place. Not in a home, for sure. Uh, I am guessing that this woman knew that Jesus did many things that other religious leaders didn't do. If you look at Mark 3, 8, you'll see that Tyrites like to come <laughs> into Galilee and see the miracles that he did. And, and so I'm, I'm sure she must have known that he 
did things like going over to a tax collector's home, Mark 2, um, that he invited a tax collector into his innermost circle. I'm sure she must have known the, that he was even willing to go and set free a demonized Gentile man, Mark chapter 5. Or that when a woman who had had this ongoing, unhealable uterine hemorrhage came to him and even touched him, he brought her the blessings of the kingdom. So uh, with that in mind, you look at verse 27, and you'll notice when she came and fell down at his feet, what he does is he engages in conversation. He dialogues with her. And as, as he does so often, he tells her a parable, a story. And you've got to know nobody's ever understood one of his stories <laughs> up to this point. But here's what he simply says. Um, first, let the children eat all they want. For it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Now, almost nobody likes that story. Uh, the, the conservatives would have said he shouldn't be talking to her like this anyway. And the liberals will say, why is he calling her a dog? I, I, can, I can imagine you're, you're thinking those things. So how on earth are we going to read this thing? I, I'm just going to tell you, it's different from anything that you might anticipate. I'll give you a few clues as to how I read it. Uh, this word that Jesus uses for children is technon, a word usually used for biological children, the word almost always used for Israel being the children of God. And the woman changes the word in verse 28 to paideon, which is usually a broader word with the entire household brought in, including those who are adopted and, and servants. So something's going on there. Family talk. And Jesus speaks of bread, notice, coming first to the technon, the biological members of the household. Uh, the Jewish people being the technon. And according to the scriptures, when Messiah came, the blessings of Messiah would first come to the people of Israel and then spill over into blessings that would bring blessing to all people. And, and then this dog word. Uh, in the parable, Jesus didn't use the word that people usually use for Gentiles when they called them dogs. Uh, that, that was keon. That's the word for, for you know, the, the scavenger dogs that would be out there that you still see in the Middle East. He changed the word. He took the edge off the word. He used canarion, uh, the word that, that is used for the household pets. So it's just not a response that anybody would have expected. So, so, so how do we read this story? Well, here's how I read it. I, I think Jesus says to this woman, don't you know that the bread of God's kingdom blessing that I bring must first go to the biological family members who have been persecuted for so long and through whose lineage I have come? Surely it's not right for me to take what must first come to my people and toss it to the pets in the household. Now, no matter how do you read this, it's a rather shocking response. I mean, there's an honesty about him following what his father had laid out. But there's no animosity in the language. And it's a parable. And again, nobody in Israel had ever understood one of his stories. And surely this uh, Gentile Tyrite woman from a demonized home isn't going to get this story right. Number four, the wrong kind of person receives the blessing of the king. Verses 28 to 30. Again, I, I'm pretty sure this woman knew that Jesus had cast out demons in his ministry. She certainly knew he was an unusual kind of rabbi. But still, you've got to face it. There was a risk when she broke into that house. She fell down at his feet and she blurts out something like this. Lord, you've got to set my daughter free from evil. Those of you who have children, do you feel the desperation of this? You can't leave my child the way she is. In ordinary circumstances, she would expect that this Jewish religious leader would just kick her out, get her out of here. But then she immediately hears him using language like first. And then family language. So in verse 28, she does what all of us should do when we read any parable of Jesus. She makes herself a part of the parable. And she says, there are crumbs that, that always fall from the table when bread is eaten, when the pets eat those crumbs, they're not stealing the children's bread. Ever since Mark chapter 6, 
Jesus has been using the illustration of bread to speak of the blessing that God is ready to give to people who follow him. And it really is amazing. I'm seeing how amazed you look. You should be more amazed. (laughs) That this Gentile, Tyrite woman from a demonized home gets it. Uh, She says, even the crumbs of God's blessing will be enough for me. Even if the bread must first go to the children of Israel, crumbs of what you bring, that will be enough. And by entering into, here's the point I want to make, by entering into the relationship with this Syrophoenician woman, Jesus expanded the ministry of the Messiah beyond anything that anyone except God could have ever anticipated for him. His his actions universalize the blessing of Messiah It stretches beyond those walls of geography and of ethnicity and of of gender and even of religious heritage. And it even opened the door for you and me to be recipients of the blessing. So I, I wonder if you see it. Jesus entered in. He entered into a relationship with somebody who was broken by sin from him and from God and from God's people. No one else had ever done this. And when he did, beautiful things began to happen. Liberation from demons. Rescue came to that home in ways that never could have happened had Jesus not gone to where the brokenness was and entered in. When he did, miracles happened. Brothers and sisters, I'm just telling you, they still do. Sometimes we don't see the power and work of God because we don't go where the darkness is so that we have to depend upon the power of God. It's clear that unless Jesus had entered in across all of those walls of division, there would have been no hope for this woman or her daughter. And truthfully, there would have been hope for almost none of us. Because as I look, most of us stand on the other side of that cultural divide that she was on too, right? And yet the kingdom comes to us and... And if we are going to go in his name, we have to identify where the broken is and we enter into relationship. Now I've got to make sure. There's an alligator pit that opens when my chapel is over. So I, I want to tell you a little bit. I want to tell you a little bit of my own story. What's brought me to a place where this matter of reconciliation is so central? As, as I tried to track back on this, the earliest I can remember it happening was when I was about 12 years old. My family had moved to a small uh, Appalachian community, Bluefield, West Virginia, beautiful town. Uh, But it was a racially segregated town. And it was mostly black-white segregation. Um, Segregated. We had uh, segregated schools. We didn't need it, but we had them. We had segregated uh, places where we lived. I lived in the white part of town. Uh, we, We had a swimming pool when the government forced it to be integrated. Um, uh, they shut it down and then cemented it over rather than having that happen. Well, I cannot remember ever having had any contact with a person of color before that time that I went there. Uh, But for me to get from the place of town where I live, which is the white part of town, to our beautiful downtown area, I had to go through another part of town. I always went with my brother. He was about 6'3", 275, football player and weightlifter, so I felt good and safe. But one Saturday morning, I still remember this so vividly, and I've told this story so many times. Faculty members, I'm sorry, you have to hear me tell it again. But I remember I wanted to go to town. My brother wasn't there. So I walked down Union Street. That's where I live, white part of town. Took a right on Bland Street. Carried me past Preston Street. Oh, no. Into the more color-filled part of town. Suddenly it hit me. What am I doing here? And I was afraid that one of the residents of that community might pop out. I don't know what I thought they would do to me. Would I get infected? I mean, well, what's going to happen? But I, but I remember I was just, when leaves would blow past, that would be, I was jumpy until I came around the corner. My dad and I went to visit just a few weeks ago to the same place, and it's still there. There's the Bundy gift shop over on the left side of the road. I came around the corner, and there it was. And there were three African-American men standing right outside the shop. They must have seen the terror on my face. And one of them just looked at me, and he said, um, Young fellow, I have some advice for you. What I think you should do is just sit down right now and have a nice, cool bottle of pop. And I think you'll learn something. 
you'll learn that we're just folks. So I did. And, and I began to learn, and I'm still learning. Uh, I learned about what sociologists now call the African-American experience in rural Appalachia. <laughs> I, I learned from them what it felt like when their children learned that the swimming pool had been shut down because of them. I learned what it felt like when, when these men, these beautiful men, my brothers in Christ as I came to know them, saw me terrorized simply because of the color of their skin. And, and something deep inside of me began to develop a longing for reconciliation. About, about five years later, I came to Chicago. I went to Moody Bible Institute. That's where I started. And uh, on the first week I was there, the Practical Christian Work Department were trying to recruit people to go and teach the Bible in the city. And naively, I volunteered. Little did I know that where I would be going is to Cabrini Green. Any, anybody know about Cabrini? I have pictures. Uh, Cabrini Green is one of the uh, housing projects, renowned, it's been torn down, renowned housing projects in Chicago. Different from other housing projects, others were built often in poorer areas. Cabrini Green was built right in the middle of the Gold Coast. And it was often called an island of darkness in the middle of light. I found it to be something very different. There was a lot of light that was there. I have pictures here. Do we have pictures of that? Yeah, let's see. Ah! There it was as I saw it. If you see the second one, you see it at the end just before it got torn down. There's the last resident who was there. If you look carefully, you'll see how the buildings have become so deteriorated. Now, as I, I went into those communities, I'll just tell you what I, what, what I, I, I encountered. I, I met moms, and sometimes dads, who loved their children and wanted a different future for them. I met older brothers and sisters who cared about their younger siblings and didn't want them to get trapped in drugs and in gangs that they were trying to get freed from. I met people who were convinced that the only real hope for their children's future was Jesus Christ. And if I was going to come there and teach about Jesus, I was going to be welcomed. And, and I, I don't know if I did a bit of good, but I got more hugs there than I think I've ever gotten in my life, even more than I get at Trinity here. <laughs> I learned something too about the power of the gospel to offer hope to people who otherwise would have no hope. I learned about how when reconciliation ministries happen and you enter into a relationship, you see more of God than you otherwise would ever see. Uh, I have so much more I'd want to say, but my call to you today in this first message is to be a person who will enter in and... Um, where God gives you the opportunity to be in a church, to deeply believe that there's a reason why that church is in its neighborhood. And it's there, incarnationally, planted there. And at the heart of it is to be the center for God's reconciling work in that place where God has put you. I want you to enter in across all the barriers. There'll be some fear, but enter in across all the barriers, not because you have to be politically correct, but simply because you've been transformed yourself by the grace of God. Are, are you a grateful follower of Jesus? Do you know when you read this story, when I read it to you, you and I should relate much more to the Syrophoenician woman than to Jesus. I mean, we're the ones he had to break into our lives. He had to give his life to reconcile us to God. And when you and I, does anybody believe that? All right, three. Okay, those of us who believe that, what happens when we deeply believe that? We go out into the world and say, this is real. You can know God as your father. You can know his forgiving and liberating power because you and I know this, that if God is willing and able to reconcile us to himself, there's hope for anyone. But they'll never know it unless we go as his witnesses and tell them about it. Because of that, for us, our starting point at Lake Avenue Church in all the discussions related to reconciliation is this one. In our polarized world, we know we have to enter into respect-filled relationships. When we get there, we've got to listen to God and ask for wisdom. We've got to be true to this word, to its morals. We've got to represent the kind of Jesus that we see in this text. We've got to do that well. But the fact is, 
Reconciliation can never be pursued without people facing one another and getting into relationship with one another, speaking with one another, understanding one another. Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us. The church must become flesh and dwell among the place people with whom God has called us to live. We have to then enter in and, and then what you have to do because the divisions are so great, we've got to find some space, time and space for us to, to talk to one another. That, that space might be the kitchen table where a estranged husband and wife maybe have a friend or a pastor help them to be able to learn to talk with one another. That space might be for those of you who have a calling to youth pastoring. It might be the youth pastor's home where parents and children who've never understood one another learn to talk with one another. That space for all of you in counseling might be the counseling room where a person who's experienced a moral fall and feels that their whole future is gone because everybody knows about this will offer them, yes, the seriousness of sin, but the greater seriousness of the grace of God. And the church of Jesus Christ is the place of both discipline and restoration. We live in this polarized world where people speak at one another. You and I, as followers of Jesus, have to learn what he did. We have to speak with one another as Jesus did with the Syrophoenician woman. The essential first step to reconciliation is the willingness to enter into a relationship and hear the other side of the story. Even if we remain unconvinced, we've got to listen and note this. Uh, when people are broken, there's no fast fix. We don't fix fast. It takes a long time. That means there's going to be so much disagreement, sometimes anger, and you don't want to just write them off, and they want to write you off, and you've got to hold on and say, we're going to stick with this thing until God brings us together. You may have to listen a long time. You're sometimes going to have to hear and feel the angst and the anger and the pain and the abuse that the person has experienced. So we, we, we try to start there. And everything that we try, we, with immigration, we try to start that with abortion issue. Instead of just setting a picket line, we try to enter into a relationship and, and say you're not going to be alone. I think this is the beginning point for the issues related to same-sex attraction. You've got to get over the fear. You've got to be able to talk about it. Uh, one of the ministries of reconciliation that we get to be a part of is the Walter Hoving Home. I have a picture of it here. Uh, you can Google it. It's what a great ministry. It's led by two of our church people, John and Elsie Benton. That they and the leaders have spent so many days and nights, first in New York, now in L.A., in Los Angeles, uh, talking to women, and in jails, Southern California, talking with women who've gotten trapped into drug addiction and prostitution. Uh, they, we go in and offer them a, a home of healing and hope. They unashamedly tell them that Jesus is going to be in the center. I, I go to the Walter Hoving home about every two or three months. Uh, when the women first come, sometimes it, they're almost comatose because of the drug problems, because of their lives. None of these women got into prostitution because that's what, as a child, that's what I want to become. You know that, right? And so, so many are comatose. Sometimes in our white churches, we feel comatose. Uh, we have to come alive when the word of God goes forward. And it feels, I go back two or three months later and uh, I see the healing of God. I see miracles happening. I don't have to wonder, is God still imminent and present in this world? Because when you enter in and you're only relying upon God and it's only the power of God who can make the change, God shows up and he does his work in powerful ways. It starts with us being those who have humbly received the gospel and then humbly offering it to a broken world. Uh, Thomas Cranmer the 16th century Archbishop of Canterbury loved this story that I've told you today. He based his prayer of humble access in the first book of common prayer on, th on this story. And it's the starting point for us. Look at it. I love it. It's for a communion time. I hope you'll use it. He says, We do not presume 
to come to this table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table. But you are the same Lord whose nature is always to show mercy. So I'll, I'll close this. Brothers and sisters, uh, what, what is going to show you the way to deal with all the brokenness and hostility of this world? Where, where are you going to get your cues? You're going to get them from Fox News or CNN? Huffington Post? You're going to get them from uh, John Stewart? Stephen Colbert, where are you going to get your cues? Talk radio? That's what's going to shape your way of dealing with the brokenness and and difficulties and hostility of our world? The Apostle Paul got his cue from Jesus. And in in one of the greatest texts about reconciliation in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he talked about this. I used to live for myself, and you know that led to all the divisions, even killing uh, those who were proclaiming Jesus. But then Jesus met me. And I found out, he said, that he died for me. Got to be humbled when that has to happen. But then repeatedly, he says in that great text, he died not just for me, but for all. But for all. But for all. And he says that changes everything. What does it change? 2 Corinthians 5, 16. I put it up here so that you will see it and not forget it. Ah, Changes this. So, because of that, from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Who's in the no one? Everyone. Christians, this has to be something that marks all of our relationships. We regard no one the way the rest of the world does. Uh, Though once we regarded Christ in that way, he says, we do so no longer. How do we regard people? Here it is. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 18. Here's, if anyone, anyone is in Christ, that person is a new creation. Hallelujah. In Christ, the old is gone. In Christ, the new has come. And it is all from God who has reconciled us, of all people, us to himself. And he has entrusted to us the ministry and the message of reconciliation. I urge you in the name of Jesus to bear it well. To his glory.